Good morning, my name is Peter Willing and welcome to Automotive EV. Today uh, we are featuring battery supply chain. Today's episode, part one of the series, is identifying bottlenecks and opportunities along the value chain of lithium ion batteries. It's my pleasure to welcome, um, in no particular order really, uh, Richard Hankinson from Unipart Logistics, Rodney Salmon from IPL Macro, Sanjeev Dakyar from JEP, Anwar Sattar from Warwick Manufacturing Group, and last but by no means least, Akin Glass from Kuna Nagel. Akin will be moderating this uh, team of experts as they steer you through the topic. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to you, Akin. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, esteemed audience, and a warm welcome from Switzerland, where I'm sitting in home office today. Similar to many, or probably most of you, I am passionate about automotive and electric vehicle, drive electrification, and a sustainable future. And I'm really pleased that we have the possibility today uh, to share with you discussions around the life cycle of the lithium ion battery. In order to guide you a little bit through this complex topic, uh, this is the only, the one and only slide that we will share with you today. Uh, we would like, we segmented the lithium ion battery value chain into five different chapters. We will start at the cradle, which means uh, we will begin our discussions around the thawing and the components which are required to build the lithium ion cell uh, and how they eventually become transported to the cell assembly plant. We then have the cellar module production, and uh, from the cellar module production, we will move the battery to the battery pack assembly, where the uh, high voltage battery eventually will be put together and then delivered to the assembly line for the electric vehicle. Those three parts will be focus of our session today. And in the February session of the battery supply chain, we will look into the aftermarket, the warranty batteries, how can we replace them at the dealerships, and we will also discuss reverse logistics of used, damaged, and defective batteries, how to collect the batteries, and how to send them for rebuild, repurpose, testing, or eventually for recycling. Once again, the objective of the session today is to identify the transport-related bottlenecks and opportunities within the first three components of the life cycle of the battery. And um, Peter already introduced you to the speakers, uh, but I would also like to give the speakers the opportunity to introduce themselves to you before we will actually then start with our first question. I cordially invite you, we cordially invite you to use the chat function in order to submit your questions to us. We will review the questions and we will answer those questions uh, as much as we possibly can. Every question yet you submit, which will not get answered throughout the next 45 minutes of this live session, will be answered in the Automotive EV Live community still today. So I encourage you all to send questions. Welcome again for joining us, and I'm now handing over to our speakers. I think, um, Mike, why don't you start first? Richard, why don't you start first? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're uh, dialing in from, um, but uh, good to see everybody. Uh, my name is Richard Hankinson. I'm Automotive Director at Unipart Logistics. So my interest in this is uh, in terms of that, that supply chain is keeping the products moving um, into the, uh, the, the production. And as we will talk about in the second session, uh, from production on and out to uh, keep the aftermarket uh, moving as well. So that's my uh, interest today. Thank you. Hi, it's uh, Rodney Salmon. Um, I'm over 30 years experience in packaging industry, in mainly in automotive and industrial. Um, I'm particularly excited about being in this particular market um, currently as the huge um, change is going on into electric vehicles and the light weighting of part means the light weighting of packaging and a different view on how we go forward in a returnable and expendable packaging. <clears throat> I'll go next. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anwar Satra. I work at the University of Warwick, uh, Warwick Manufacturing Group specifically. My focus mainly at work is to look at end of life so things like recycling, um, and but um, I think today I'm here just to provide some technical support. I think in the next session would be where um, I truly shine, as you were. 
Great. Hi, I, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Sandra Takia. Um, I work for uh, Chep Automotive and Industrial Solutions. I'm the head of Innovation Solution and Strategic Marketing. Uh, again, you know, very, very passionate about uh, the subject matter. You know, at Chep, we we have many touch points throughout the the industry with the OEM suppliers, 3PLs, and uh, yeah, like Rodney said, real, real. Um, Real big opportunity now to collaborate, to identify, develop, and deliver some real innovative best-in-class supply chain solutions throughout the industry that will serve us better for for the future. So, looking forward to the session. Excellent. Thank you, guys, for your introduction. Um, as mentioned previously, we will focus today from the moment the material is being sourced, sustainably sourced uh, overseas, predominantly in Australia and Africa and South America, up to the moment when the finalized battery pack is being built uh, into, into the EV. So that's the scope of the session today. And we would like to follow the life cycle of the battery. Therefore, I would like to start my first question today to our battery engineer, to Anwar. Anwar, can you share some, some insights with us? What actually are the parts and the components that are required to build a lithium ion cell? So we start with a cell. Yeah, sure. So a lithium ion cell consists of five components. So the first component is uh, the what we call the cathode or the positive electrode. Positive electrode is basically um, cathode, so metal oxide powder, which contains all the fancy uh, uh, fancy metals such as your lithium, your nickel, your cobalt, and it's coated onto an aluminium foil. So that's the that's the cathode. And the next component is the negative electrode, which is the anode. The anode is basically carbon powder or graphite, and it's coated onto an aluminium foil. Um, then you have the separator, which separates the two. Uh, the separator consists, uh, it's just basically a plastic sheet. Um, and then you have the electrolyte. The electrolyte is very important for the working of the battery. It allows the chemical reactions to occur within the battery. And finally, you have the casing, um, which protects the uh, elements from the environment. Now, each obviously, each of those elements or chemicals um, in themselves have their own particular properties. For example, the electrolyte is what makes the lithium-ion batteries so dangerous as it consists of highly volatile and flammable material. And um, yeah, so if, if you've got any further questions, I'd, be, I'd love to um, help out on this. And well, where are those? Uh, I could imagine that the casing is probably man then manufactured in the country where the, where the battery is being put together, but the raw material, where are that coming from? You know, what are the, the predominant origins? Because I suppose they don't grow in our backyards. No, but um, as part of the European Union, we've got this, uh, well, okay, no longer in the UK, but uh, in the EU, we've got this agreement that we cannot buy material from places where there would likely be child labor or forced labor. So actually, um, a lot of the material that is used in batteries manufactured in the EU comes from, uh, you know, sort of more, uh, I would say sustainable sources, but, uh, you know, much better in terms of uh, humanitarian uh, needs. So a lot of our nickel comes from Norway, I think, or Russia, cobalt, I think, from Finland, etc. But obviously, in the future, we have to tap into other resources because we won't be able to meet the uh, demand. Okay, okay. Anba, thank you. Let me ask um, uh, the next question then to Richard with regards to transportation of these of these components of the raw materials from, from all over the world, may it be Finland, may it be Uganda, may it be Australia. Um, is, is there anything in particular, Richard, where you say uh, this is what we, this is what's important. This is the bottleneck. This is an opportunity with regards to transporting these goods to our factories um, here in Europe. Well, I think thanks, um, Akim. I, I and I think uh, Anwar has already mentioned that um, you know ultimately that this is not your traditional components going into uh, vehicle production. Uh, these are not palletized. They're not on a nice, neat uh, tray presented to the production line. Uh, these are raw materials, the, the copper, the lithium, uh, the cobalt, et cetera. And that in itself requires specialism in terms of uh, the transportation. Uh, and again, as mentioned, the second thing is really that these aren't produced nice and conveniently right next door to uh, where the cells, the batteries, or even the vehicles are, are being produced. Uh, they are in far-flung parts of the world. Um, and yes, we are in the EU, not that we're in it, um, trying to, uh, to source these sustainably. Um, but in reality, you know, let, let's face face that, half the world's um, cobalt is mined out of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, but that's only the mining. Then it's got to go to refining, and half of that, the world's cobalt, is then uh, uh, refined in China. 
So mm -hmm. you've already got um, huge distances being travelled. And again, as Anwar mentioned, you know, some of this is not necessarily out of countries that um, we, we would uh, find easy to mm -hmm. ship in and out mm -hmm. of, put it that way, and with good records uh, on the humanitarian front. Um, so once you've done that and you've brought all of these raw materials in some pretty large quantities um, to the point of the cell manufacturer, um, it, I think really it's just illustrating how complex this supply chain is. Mm -hmm. and, you know, we are no longer in the EU. I need remind nobody of that and the challenges around even shipping between the UK and the EU, because that's nothing to, to try to move these products from some of these parts of the world. Um, so that, that brings risk into the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we really, really need to get to the bottom of this, get into something that is far more sustainable, because we are only just touching on the, uh, uh, the, the volume that is um, you know, ahead of us here. Mm -hmm. um, the, the EV volumes yet are a fraction of what they will be. Um, so I think we need to hold that debate off for the next panel which is around you know, how we do bring more sustainability into this, into that circular economy, and mm -hmm. avoiding the need to continue to dig the products out of the ground. But that's what we are faced with today. And increasingly, we are not going to be able to use the likes of Finland um, for the, the world's production of, of cobalt. That's for okay. sure. Okay. Okay. So we identified some, uh, some bottlenecks already. And I think the opportunities are then for companies within the European Union to go to nearshoring, but as it stands today, we are still depending on, on, on getting these raw materials from, from faraway locations, which actually yeah. takes, me, takes me to the next question. We have two packaging experts over here, and let's just assume that along the battery journey, as we only have uh, 45 minutes for the entire session, let's just assume that the raw material, which we discussed now, uh, has arrived at the cell production site, uh, and, now, and now the cell is being, is being produced. Um, when it comes to packaging, uh, first question goes to you, Redney. Uh, what are the implications around the packaging of lithium-ion batteries in general? Well, at last, we're seeing some kind of um, continuity here. Um, so the, the, the lithium battery is made up of obviously the cell, the module, and the pack, or the case. I mean, what we're seeing here is the expendable packaging and small plastic returnable packaging is being used for the movement of lithium cells and the module. Um, and uh, so, some of some of that is uh, plastic is expendable, but that's being recycled after use. Um, and then the other part um, is large containers, um, totes that are on a returnable basis. Um, the packs are different matter. The packs have no commonality in size, and therefore it's very difficult to have any kind of standardization throughout the packaging of, of the actual finished finished product of lithium battery. Um, most of these batteries, because of the weight, are being carried in steel racks. Um, and uh, th this, is, this is sort of the commonality we're seeing at the moment. Um, with, with the advancement of different types of, of extended pl um, plastic packaging, you'll see um, some of that coming in maybe in a couple of two, two, two or three years time to take over some of, some of the, the steel racks because one thing certain that we've got to get in the supply chain is the light weighting of packaging. Um, you know, light, lighter, you know, if you're saving uh, five to 6,000 kilos per truck, per trailer, per trip, um, you know, you're, you're, you're saving a lot of emissions, okay, you're saving a lot of fuel. And as in, as in the, 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 the weight of the batteries, they're getting lighter and lighter because obviously the battery has to last longer to get more kilometers and miles on it. And therefore all the parts in the vehicle are getting lighter. So that's the commonality we're beginning to see at the moment. Okay, thank you, Rodney, for your for your point of view. Um, I'd like to ask the same question to you, Sanjeev. Um, what is what what is your view on this packaging for lithium-ion batteries? So, so first and foremost, um, I think most people are aware now that uh, you know the explosive nature of of these commodities, um, and therefore it's important that you you do um, you know, attain to the, the regulations um, and namely, you know, these are classed as dangerous goods and therefore have to meet UN9 um, regulations. And these, these UN9 regulations we've seen do vary from, from country to country, um, which, is, which is another challenge. But um, certainly, you know, 
businesses should start looking at making sure that they adhere to those necessary standards. I think also the, the second thing is you know, looking at looking at what Richard mentioned around sustainability and how we can create um, an industry and create an environment whereby we are reducing the amount of miles, empty miles traveled. Um, and that's going to come about by collaborating to share and reuse the same type of packaging. Um, and of course, you know, that's very challenging today because everybody is as as you know, as, as expected is is focusing on their own particular needs mm -hmm. but it's important that we bring people together to collaborate so that we can find common denominators and you know companies like ourselves work with with uh, the industry to come up with those standard solutions that yeah may not be the the, the right and the most cost effective option today but looking forward and as we ramp up the volume um, we are going to see huge benefits if everyone is using the same container pool. To create synergies, obviously, then between. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yes. Okay. I, I do understand. Um, let me come back to Anwar. So, so now we, along the journey of the, of the battery, let's just assume again, the lithium cell has been, has been produced, but actually there are different types of lithium cells. And Anwar, again, question to you as a, as an engineer over here, can you can you uh, guide us a little bit through the different types of cells uh, that are that are around? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so when you say different types of cells, there's two ways you can approach this. You can either approach it by chemistry or you can approach it by the geometry. I'll just talk about the geometry today. So um, forget the chemistry. Uh, when we talk about cell geometry, there's three main types that are being used in um, vehicle applications. You've got the cylindrical, which come in 18650 or 21700. Now, 18650 denoting that it's 18 millimeters um, thick and uh, 60, uh, sorry, 65 millimeters long. 21700 is 21 millimeter thick and um, 70 uh, millimeters long. Now, those are the standardized ones. So that's the only uh, geometry that's standardized. So actually, from a packaging perspective, that can quite easily be overcome. Um, the problem becomes when you go to the pouch cells or the prismatic cells because of the non-standardized sizes. So every company that makes these pouch or makes um, uh, uh, prismatic cells, they make them according to their own design. So it's not standardized. And the biggest problem I foresee is uh, for pouch cells. So pouch cells, they have a very flimsy casing, so they're very easily damaged. They also have two electrodes protruding from them. So if you imagine an A4 piece of paper with two bits of metal sticking out, that's what a pouch cell is. And you can imagine that can easily short circuit. If you just drop a tool onto it, short circuits and you get a fire. If you touch it, if you touch those to a metal surface, you get a fire. If you drop one on top of the other, again, you know, there's a chance that it could short circuit and you get a fire. So actually from a transportation perspective, they're by far the biggest uh, problem causes and it's going to be causing the Biggest issues, I think, for transportation. Prismatic cells are just basically, if you if you imagine your old Nokia phone battery, it's just a mm -hmm. big version of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, anybody else wants want, wants to join this discussion here from from the speakers with regards to transport related issues? Okay, transport related issues again of these cells. You, you mentioned uh, fragility. Um, also, Sanjeev, you said before dangerous goods. I mean, w what can actually happen? So one one point I'd like to mention is you've you mentioned there Anwar, the the volatility of these components to their environment um, and you know I know Hakim you you Kunanagel have run have run trials in in looking at uh, the heat you know through the uh, through the supply chain and the effect that could the potential have you I mean effectively you're creating you know a bomb <laughs> you know that could go off so in terms of um, you know tracking. I think is a, is another another key element um, that we need to have in in the battery supply chain, so that we can monitor not just only the location of these very valuable and expensive assets, but also um, to monitor their condition in terms of exposure specifically to high temperature, but also potentially to shock. So again, this is this is an area that um, you know is is there's a lot of research taking place at the moment. We know that there are solutions available. The cost is is relatively high, but obviously that is coming down. Um, but again, it's it's finding the optimum solution that will work 
um, to provide that that full visibility. I think uh, just adding to that, um, one of the worst scenarios that we have at the moment um, is non-standardization with regard to testing of packaging being used in the market to carry these delicate objects. Um, it's absolutely ridiculous in this day and age that we can't have a global standards across dangerous goods. Um, there's varying uh, standards. China's got their own and they don't allow anybody else to have it. Um, America's got their standards. The European have got their standards. In fact, um, when you look at, look at different standards, it, even in Europe, and it's crazy that we can't get a global standard so that the world can get on with the moving these delicate parts, you know, in a standardized way and everybody understand exactly what's needed. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. OK. Um, anybody else wants to mention something about about fire safety, about explosion? Anything else you, you would like to mention? Or shall we move on to the next question? And I cordially invite the audience again, please submit your questions uh, so that we can pick them up and that we can answer them here. This is a live session, so we will take care of all your requirements and concerns immediately. So I invite you to submit your questions. So back to the speakers. Any, anything else or shall we move on to, to the next topic? Um, Let's move on then. Um, with regards to ANVA, question to you again. Um, we, we have already agreement that many of these parts and components are coming from, from far away uh, locations. Um, we are talking now about the lithium cell. So the lithium cells are predominantly coming out of China, 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 Japan, and Korea. So from Asia, they go, they go into Europe. Um, from an engineering perspective, not from a transport perspective, we speak about that data, but from an engineering perspective, what, what are your thoughts around that? Where are opportunities and where are bottlenecks? Well, this is a, this is a good question. It can, actually, you can, you, you can go into many facets in this. Um, so I think the biggest issue, and, and this is not just uh, for Europe, this is all over the world, apart from you know, outside certain countries in Asia, is the skills gap. So if you imagine now, most European countries, they've got zero cell production capability or thereabouts, very, very low. And suddenly you want to go to a place where you, know, you have these massive gigawatt uh, or, or gigafactories which produce gigawatt hours of uh, you know, cells per year. Well, you know, at the moment, we don't have people that can manage those facilities. We don't have people that can build those facilities. We don't have people trained that can work in those facilities. So actually, you know, plugging that gap is a big, massive challenge. And it's something that we at WMG have, uh, you know, sort of realized, and we're using it as an opportunity to expand into, so to provide training courses uh, and to, to train people in order so that they can work in such environments. Um, mm -hmm. The other challenge is, of course, uh, planning planning laws. I mean, to give you an example, I was talking to a guy from Nissan, and they were saying that um, in China, they wanted to open up a, a big gigafactory, and within six months, it was done. So, you know, six months to sort of thinking about it to bam, you know, it's there. Whereas if you were to do something like that in Europe, well, you know, six years maybe, <laughs> it's not easy. So, you know, that's the sort of thing that you're competing with. Um, of course, the other thing is the whole ecosystem. So, um, you know, it's not just the, the gigafactory that's gonna be built, it's also gonna be the chemical suppliers, the material suppliers, uh, you know, all of that has to come in. Uh, that will come in, of course, but um, you know, it's it's a bit of the chicken and egg scenario. You know, what, what do you put first? Do you get the economy, uh, the ecosystem ready first, or do you have the gigafactory first? Well, one can't work without the other, so you know, it's it's a bit of a difficult scenario. Um, and then the other, um, well, I mean, you know, all of these things, of course, they present opportunities. So whatever there's a challenge, there's an opportunity. So you know, with each. With each challenge, oh, oh yeah, sorry, there was one other one I wanted to mention. It was the um, space. So uh, British Vault, for example, they're looking for a you know a site in the UK, and the site that they're looking for, well, apparently it's going to be something like the 13th largest building in the world. Mm -hmm. So you know that's the kind of spaces that we're talking about when it comes to gigafactories. So okay, yeah. okay, that, that that makes sense. Uh, that makes sense, Richard. What does it mean to your customers? You are very big and very active uh, with, within the automotive industry, all of us are, but these constraints which Ander just mentioned, what does it mean to your clients and, and, and how can, can Unipart, and is Unipart helping their customers? Thanks, um, Akeem. I think Amwas just mentioned uh, British Vault and you know, it is 
absolutely vital that uh, UK PLC and all of the OEMs that uh, operate within the UK do create this capacity um, within the UK for the cell production um, and bring this you know, much closer to home, um, this localization. So that that's the long term. But uh, and, and clearly we are investing um, a lot of money in that as, as UK, but not fast enough. If you look at the um, uh, you know, what, what Europe is doing at the moment and you know, Tesla with their Berlin factory is just immense and they are doing everything from cradle to grave. They are going to be producing the, the cell all the way through to the battery manufacturer, uh, all the way through to the vehicle manufacturer, um, all, all within one campus. I mean, it's mm -hmm. going to be like some operation and up to 500,000 vehicles. That's what we're up against. Okay. We have to address that here. But let's just talk about the, the, the short term, which is the fact the reality at the moment is that most of these cells are coming from Asia. And mm -hmm. yeah, that ought to be bread and butter to your company, my company. You know, we are logistics. That's what we do. We move products. But at the moment, it is a huge problem. I mean, if we're talking about bottlenecks as part of this um, uh, discussion today, then we need to put a big red flare up right now because out of China at the moment, um, supply and demand, well, we've got far more demand than we've got supply. Um, yeah, and I think uh, just just cut to the chase here, what does it really mean? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you've got to book that, um, that capacity much further in advance, the rates are just skyrocketing. Um, you know, at um, points last year, you would, uh, uh, you know, a year ago, you were talking about sixteen hundred pound for a container out of China. You, you, you now anything up to ten thousand um, pounds. Some some customers are being charged. It's mm -hmm. it's phenomenal. And so, you know, all of us look for for options, and you, know, you can do the rail um, out of China. It's you know, it knocks a couple of weeks off the um, uh, the lead time out of China, uh, so that sounds great. But again, there's a there's not much of that capacity, and it's a lot more expensive than than the sea freight. So this is a huge, huge problem for for the industry at the moment, mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't see it getting better in the short term, and that that is a worry. Um, you know, the you know, frankly operating under the pandemic is is having a massive impact on supply chains globally um, in terms of the dynamics of where products coming from, the shopping habits. I mean, let, let's be honest, you know, thinking about what our own habits are at home. Yeah. Doing a lot more online and an awful lot of that is coming uh, ultimately out of uh, the Far East. So that is something that we've got to do. We've got to get um, uh, th this capability into the UK so that we are less reliant um, upon uh, these these supply chains that uh, are ultimately subject to other industries, supply and demand as well. And at the moment, mm -hmm. it's a big problem out of Asia. Mm -hmm. On our journey around the life cycle of the battery, when we started with, with, with the far shoring and we spoke about different prismatic pouch cells and um, fire risk, et cetera. Let's now assume that actually the batteries safely arrived uh, or the raw materials arrived to Europe we built the cells, okay, and and actually um, th there's word on the street that there's um, a not to be underestimated fault faulty error uh, area that the batteries actually are being rejected when they're being delivered uh, to the OEM because because of certain issues. And uh, I was wondering, Sanjeev, you're nodding. Maybe Sanjeev uh, and Rodney, does this have to do with packaging? Have you heard about that? Can you confirm this? <laughs> I th can, can I just make one point on that? Um, at, at the risk of blowing our own trumpet, as you know, Hyperbat is, is a unipart um, company, joint venture with, with Williams, and we are building um, batteries in the UK, not cells. We are taking the cells mm -hmm. um, in, and I won't divulge who we source those from, but uh, um, it is from Asia. Let's be uh, uh, honest about it. But we're not seeing... Um, any failure rates that, that are, are of a concern, you clearly get the odd one. You will test the cell in terms of the uh, the, the voltage um, and a couple of other tests as well. But mm. we're not seeing 
failure rates um, significantly on, on that. So yes, okay. you do have to deal with what happens if there's a failure, but the volumes at the moment of, of that instances of that are very low. Okay, good. Good yeah, it's not it's not something that we've um, we've we've really come across at this stage. Um, but that being said, yes, we do need to know how to deal with it. And obviously, you know, as the volumes ramp up, yeah, we're we're still we're still at the bottom of the hockey curve, right? So this is going to ramp up, you know, extremely quickly over the next you know ten years, if not longer. Um, but it, it's going to ra ramp up exponentially and. You know, clearly packaging will then play a, a very, very important part in terms of ensuring that the products are protected and that they arrive in the condition that they're they're intended to. Um, you know, battery cells, modules, and then even the packs, obviously, that they they're so critical to the vehicle. And we've seen that, you know, over the course of the pandemic, where or the, or over the summer, where um, for whatever reason, electric vehicle you know sales boomed and but you know the, the companies just couldn't couldn't build enough vehicles and that was really down to not having the battery so having faulty batteries arrive at the plant is just not going to be an option mm -hmm. Okay, um, let me go to the to the live stream over here. We received a series of questions uh, from from Chris B. The question is, and this goes then uh, again to our packaging experts over here, to Rodney, send it to you. Um, does all packaging need to be UN certified for the cell module and pack? Does all packaging need to be cert UN certified for the cell, for the module, and for the pack? It's a very good point. Okay. It really goes back to my previous question is at the moment we're struggling to get a standard okay globally of what is acceptable and what isn't acceptable so what is acceptable um in in the china the united nations or the sorry china negotiations is not acceptable maybe in america is maybe not acceptable in europe um mm -hmm. and crazy and and really we if we carry on like this and somebody doesn't have a global standard in you're going to transport product from asia into europe or america into europe something's going to happen and then the americans will blame europe the chinese will blame europe europe will blame them and the only people who are going to win out of this is the solicitors the lawyers all right so we really have to get to get to grips on this and understand it um you know th there isn't um, unfortunately a standardization on some on some views at the moment moving finished lithium batteries can be mm -hmm. termed without dangerous goods anything happens to the lithium and battery whether it needs recharging or it's faulty in any way then that's a total different specification with regard to the packaging mm -hmm. and we've seen an incident recently with um an oem that uh, had to send have had their bot batteries from america into europe the batteries were faulty they had to go um, all the way back to america and they, they they because they didn't think about the packaging in the first place it cost them a fortune to have one packaging going one way and a totally mm -hmm. different packaging going the other way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rodney, I understand. Again, the question was less around the standardization, but around the certification. The question was, yeah. does it all have to be UN certified? And I mean, and the answer is yes. Okay. As yeah. we know, every, every, every lithium ion battery, the packaging needs to be UN certified, regardless whether it's a cell, a module, or, or, or a battery pack. Yeah. The, the answer to that question is yes, but there is still there is still some ambiguity around it. So as Rodney said, if you look at, you know, with a UN, you know, UN standard, you would think that okay, it applies to every country. But from the work that we're doing in different regions, obviously we're a global business, we've seen that there is there is there are differences, and it's um, you know depending on the the weight of the individual cell how it's packaged inside the box how um how much charge it has this this is very very complex so yeah. it's uh it's something again that you know we're still getting our heads around um and we still uncover new challenges but but we are getting there but look the the bigger picture here is that you know certification is not just a case of getting a tick in a box so that you can sell your product it's about protecting the product, but more importantly, protecting the people who are going to potentially handle this product. So, you know, whether the box packaging is UN certified or not, I think we all, all of us who are operating in this industry have the, uh, the, the due diligence to make sure that the product is protected so that if 
you know, it does get dropped or it gets impacted, you're not going to create a, you know, catastrophic, potentially catastrophic situation. And I think that for us is the bigger picture here, okay. rather than putting tick, ticks in boxes. Understood. Uh, let me go to the next question. Um, Anwar, I'm looking at you over here. Here's a question from Chris B. And Chris yeah. is asking the question, how does static affect these batteries? I would not be able to answer the question. So I, I'm looking at you. I hope that you will be able to, to have an answer to that. How does uh, static affect the batteries? That's actually a really good question. I haven't looked into this personally. Uh, just from thinking outside the box, I mean, I guess a static charge or something, a static discharge would create some sort of a spark or it may, you know, like jolt the battery or something. Um, I don't think uh, personally that it will create too much of an issue for the battery. However, what I will do, Chris, is I'll look into it and I'll get back to you on the um, automotive EV Live. If you can ask me the question on the automotive EV Live, I'll, yep, yep. I'll answer it in more detail. Very good. And Chris, you're happy to connect, obviously, with Anwar on, on, the, on the community. Next question comes from Tarek M. And Tarek, actually, he's asking two questions. Uh, the first one is, are new battery plants in Europe, for example, the one from Nissan in the United Kingdom, likely to be assembling cells into batteries or making the whole thing from the raw materials? Can I can I answer the first one? Um, yeah, so the answer is yes, uh, it will be. It will be making it from the raw materials. So we've actually got a template facility being built in the UK. Um, it should be opening very soon. It's called the UK BIC, UK Battery Industrialization uh, Center. Uh, center, center, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Sahib. Um, so yeah, so basically that's just a template facility. It's just a small facility. It's just like a test run for a gigafactory, and they'll be taking in raw materials and actually making um, cells different formats from the ground up. The Nissan plant actually um, makes cells as well. So although although they don't make them from the sort of the powders, what they do is they get pre-made cathodes and anodes, and they they do make cells. So they don't just uh, put the cells into the packs. They actually make the cells and packs from the cells. Okay, okay. So, so actually, we have both scenarios. We have cells coming in from Asia, and in Europe, they're being manufactured into modules and into battery packs. But also, Anwar, you said there there are locations where actually in Europe we are having small mm -hmm. cell production. Okay. Yeah. The the second part of the question has um, has again to do with with uh, packaging. So uh, Tarek is asking the question: Which presents more packaging challenges, the cells or the finished battery? Can I take that one? Um, yes. it, it's not an easy question to answer in that there are many angles to all of this. A cell itself is, it has packaging around it. It, it is relatively self-contained. Um, you do actually, ironically, both raise risk and reduce risk as you build it into a, a full pack. You reduce risk because you're putting another layer on another packaging around it. So you are mm -hmm. you're putting more containment. Um, and at the moment, therefore, you are able, so long as you treat the battery with the right level of charge capacity and you don't put more than 30 percent charge in, you can move a finished battery pack off the end of a production line to the vehicle production plant without having um, big, expensive, complex containment packaging. Mm -hmm. Its own pack is a containment. However, the downside is that once you've built uh, the cells into a pack, you have all of those connections, all of those spot welds, all of that um, opportunity to have a short circuit. So, yeah, on, the one one way you're adding containment um, by putting it into a pack, but conversely you're adding risk. And I think we talked a lot about you know, the, the, the risk around transport, but uh, perhaps I ought to have um, jumped in when we were talking about that because it's not just the transport; it's the storage um, risk as well. Mm -hmm. And whether you're talking about transport or whether you're talking about um, storage, you really need to think about three things. What are the regulations? And we've already talked about, you know, standardization. There ain't a huge amount of that. It, can, it varies by country, but worse than that, it can vary by region um, in terms of the, the requirements, uh, particularly for storage. But then you need to think about insurance, because increasingly we are finding that the insurance companies 
uh, want a higher level of protection than the regulations are, are actually demanding. Um, so that, again, you're getting into a, a question of, of cost as to whether you, you want to do that. But uh, um, the last piece is, is business risk or business continuity. You know, it's, I, I, this is something, and I trust my finance uh, colleagues are not on this call watching this at the moment because uh, I'm going to drop a minute. But a lot of the debates we have in our organisation is not about the cost of doing something, mm -hmm. but about the cost of not doing something. Okay. And if you don't put in the levels of protection um, for for this product, uh, these products, then yeah, there is a risk to um, business continuity. There's a risk to vehicle production. There's a vis risk to um, yeah, your, your your brand reputation, um, and all of that comes at a at a cost. So yeah, whether it's fire detection suppression systems, you know, the temperature and humidity controls, venting. Um, or even sensors and trying to get into build sensors into the battery packs in the first place that will detect uh, and and warn of an impending issue uh, mm -hmm. with a with a pack. The bottom line is you you've got to put in a lot of controls here, uh, a lot of okay. protection. So Richard, to um, if uh, request for a short answer, the question was. What brings more more challenges, the cell or the battery? And I think you you answered this question very very lengthily, but in order to make sure that and very good because it, it's very complex. It also depends on the life cycle of the battery. Obviously, used battery, damaged battery. But is it more challenging for cell or for a battery pack? What is your opinion? Just to give uh, to give Tarik. I you. My, my, again, the regulations are ever so slightly different, but I, I would say very quickly, the cells are actually ironically easier uh, to store than mm -hmm. the, the, the packs, and partly that's a, a size thing as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's just we have so many questions, and uh, actually we yeah. only have four or five minutes left. And I'm I'm picking up the questions, uh, esteemed audience, uh, by order of how they are coming into the live stream. So we are having uh, my friend Martin from Holland. Martin K is asking the question: uh, Raw materials moved from South America to China. Cells moved uh, to the United States, and battery packs moved to Europe. Recycled material moved to, to to anywhere in the world. Do we know how much it takes to be carbon neutral? You know, how much it takes to be carbon neutral. <clears throat> Again, it, well, anybody would like to take up to take up the question over here? A lot of work, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and a lot of a lot of collaboration. You know, at the moment, it's about, you know, obviously cost is a big impact. You know, people are, you know, companies are trying to look at work at what is the most optimum supply chain. But this is. It's a very, very dynamic environment. So, you know, the strategies that OEMs are taking in terms of how do they produce the battery packs? Do they do it all in house? Do they buy the cells? Do they buy the raw material? How that moves and where does it come from around the world? It's it's very dynamic and it's changing, you know, week by week in terms of the strategies that we're seeing from 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 car manufacturers. And of course, that's because demand will change and demand is going to ramp up. And therefore, that that changes the decision in terms of what is the optimum supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, so but I think I think hopefully my clothes will agree that there is a long way to go in terms of getting that carbon neutral. But clearly, um, you know, the industry is very much focused on that aspiration uh, and that will come more and more into their you know, into their planning and into their strategies as time goes on. At the moment, electric vehicles for most OEMs is a very, very small proportion of what they actually manufacture. But mm. in 10 years time, it will become by far the, the most common thing. And therefore, it will have much, uh, a much bigger impact in terms of the overall carbon neutrality. Okay. If I can uh, add to that. Um, so a lot of the carbon produced uh, with lithium-ion batteries comes from the production, and in particular, the uh, the, the drawing of the, um, uh, the work areas. So lithium-ion batteries are very sensitive to moisture in uh, during the production stage. So actually taking that moisture and drawing it, that's probably the biggest uh, or one of the biggest carbon emitting uh, thing. But uh, in order to get carbon neutrality is localization. For example, why ship them to China for recycling? 
two miles down the road, or two kilometers down the road. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so localization is the, the key to carbon neutrality. Okay. And obviously, there's, there's certain things that you can't localize. Yeah. Uh, materials, but what you can, you should. Okay. Being prudent of the time, um, I, I would like to to come come to the last question. Um, in fact, there's a question from uh, from Roy F. Uh, and Roy is asking a question which we which I suggest we are tackling on the next session because he asked for the rules of moving unstable batteries and um, accident damage dealer return batteries. Okay, are they classified as waste return batteries? Super interesting topic. We will we will park this question and we will take this into um, we will start with this question. So thanks, Roy. Um, on the next session when we speak about the aftermarket and the reverse logistics. And Jürgen E. Jürgen is asking the question, this should be the last question then for the day, um, how to deal with prototypes that are not yet UN certified? How to deal with prototypes, shipping of prototype EV batteries that are not yet UN certified? And there are other questions from Alessandro, for example, we will answer those then after the session uh, in uh, on, the, on the community automotive EV live. Uh, but again, question from Jürgen over here, how to deal with prototypes that are not yet UN certified? Anybody what's, would like to, to take this up? I mean, from what from what we've seen with, with prototypes and even low production, um, you know, they just look at bespoke packaging. So we've seen, you know, wooden crates used and, and you know, put together and boxing, you know, product in. I think... The UN certification in terms of the packaging, yes, it's an ideal situation, but it goes back to my previous point. It's it's about making sure that you're reducing the risk of causing damage to that product, A, to, to protect it from becoming faulty, but also to protect it from becoming dangerous. So um, yeah, that's how the industry is dealing with with prototypes and very low low volumes today. Um, but But that's really down to the fact that there aren't these standardized you know certified packaging solutions um in place that can deal with you know very big battery packs mm -hmm. um, but yes somebody i didn't know who somebody said something i didn't pick up who it was no okay all right well also prototypes um a prototype is a prototype, so they're not in the serial production. And and I do understand the first hundred batches of a particular uh, battery are being considered prototypes. But once you move to 101, the 101 battery, then the UN certified packaging is mandatory, whereas it's not mandatory uh, by law to have UN certified packaging. However, they are, of course, uh, restrictions from carriers and also freight forwarding companies who possibly reject a prototype battery if it's not a UN certified box. Uh, but by law, there's no UN certification required. Uh, esteemed audience, esteemed speakers, I think we have come to an end. We are already three minutes over and, and we do apologize that um, we have more questions, which we will answer in the live chat by the prudent of everybody's time schedule. So um, I would, uh, without further ado, um, hand back to you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of all of the audience, really, absolutely superb session. Thanks very much. So thanks to all of you. Uh, thank you, Arkin, for uh, moderating so well and, and keeping the flow going. Um, really looking forward to part two. And uh, obviously, the, 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 the panel will, will sort of uh, answer the questions that we can't. And uh, we look forward to uh, part two of this session uh, this next month. Thank you all, um, really appreciate it. And um, let's have a, a, a good 2021 this year. Take care. Thank you all. all the best, Thank everybody. you, Thank you for watching. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye, you. Everybody.